Good morning, South Lake. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Julie Jin, and I'm the children's pastor here. At this time, let's all gather our hearts together as we come before God in worship and praise. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant of faithful promises and time and time again you have proven you do just what you say though the storms may come and the winds may blow i'll remain steadfast and then my heart learn when you speak a word it will come to pass great is your faithfulness to me great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting sun i will praise your name oh great is your faithfulness to
sun to the setting sun, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness to me. From the rising sun to the setting sun, I'm always surrounded 
This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how. We say it may look. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how I find my battles. This is how it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you, God. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I find. So God, in sickness or in celebration, if we're experiencing pain or if we're rejoicing over what you've done, God, God, we thank you that you are with us in the heartache and you're with us in the celebration. And God, we pray that even if it's strange now how we're worshiping you and the strange places that we're worshiping you, God, we thank you that you are receiving our praises and that you are working in our lives and you are walking with us, you're surrounding us and you are fighting for us in what's happening. Give us ears to hear what you have to say to us today, God. Give us eyes to see and help us to open our hearts to what you have. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, it's great to be with you today. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name is Gina and I'm one of the pastors here. And before we continue in our service, I have a question for you. We're in the season of all things pumpkin flavored, pumpkin spice lattes, pumpkin breads and muffins. So here's my question, pumpkin flavors, yes or no? If you're new joining us for the first time, we're so glad that you're here checking out our services. For those of us that call Willow South Lake our home, one of the things that we get to do is we get to give to God generously to move forward the work of his kingdom through his local church. And some of the ways you can do that is to go online at wslathome.org slash give or to mail a check here to our physical address at 625 Barclay in Lincolnshire. We're so grateful for the ways that you give uh, to move God's work forward. Now we have a lot happening in our church in the month of October, and so I wanna share with you about what's coming up. Now last weekend, we heard from our senior pastor, Dave Dummett, and he shared more about God's vision for our church and what's next for us. He talked about a new online spaces. He talked about everyone being in a group. He talked about uh, X factor multiplication and us being together as one multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-campus church. And we know that with new vision, often there's a new strategy that comes with it to help accomplish the vision. And Along with a new strategy, oftentimes there are new organizational structures as well. And with this new vision, there are some structural changes to our church and some staffing implications. And so we want to have a chance to share with you a little bit about what that's gonna look like here specifically at Willow South Lake. And so we're gonna have a core meeting this Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. where we can share with you a little bit about what those structural changes look like. And you'll also have a chance to hear from all of our next-gen pastors. These are our 
kids and student pastors, they're gonna to get to share with you a little bit about what's happening with our kids and students during the winter. And then we'll also be joined by Dave Dummett, our senior pastor, and Tim Stevens, our executive pastor of campuses. They'll be around to answer any questions that you have about the new vision and strategy. And uh, it'll just be a time for us to, to unpack what that means for our church together. So join us for that. Again, that's this Wednesday, October 21st at 8 p.m. You can go to wslathome.org to get the link for that. We'll also email it out. And if you can't make the meeting, we'll record it and have that link available for you afterwards to watch. Now we know in this season where a lot of our normal routines and rhythms have been disrupted, that it can be easy to drift away from God and from other people. But as a church, we want to be gathering together and growing in the ways that we can in the season. And so we have a couple specific opportunities coming up for us to do just that. We have an opportunity to gather together outdoors on Friday, October 30th for a worship night. Now this is a time again where a lot of our kids' routines have been disrupted too. And so at that worship night, we're inviting kids to come in their costumes. We'll have some treat bags available and so they'll be able to grab those. But we're gonna have a chance to worship together from five to 6 p.m. It's a little bit earlier in the day so we can take advantage of the sunlight, but we wanna gather together, worship together outdoors. And then we'll get to see our kids hanging out in their costumes and worshiping. It's gonna be a great night. So put that on your calendars, save the date, and we hope to see you there. Now today, we get to hear from our associate pastor, Scott Woods. Now Scott's an insightful Bible teacher. He's the biggest Cubs fan I know, and he's our resident Willow South Lake comedian. So I'm excited for you to hear from him today as he unpacks God's desire for us to be in community. So let's go ahead and join in with Scott now. Well, good morning, Willow South Lake. My name's Scott, I'm one of the pastors here, and it is a pleasure to be with you on this fall morning. Uh, just a little while ago, I was reading an article that I found quite fascinating and also slightly disturbing at the same time. Right after World War I, so we're talking about a hundred or more years ago, in the country of Switzerland decided that they were going to start collecting and holding in reserve items that they seemed and deemed to be essential to human life food, clothing, all of these sorts of things that they would have, and they just stockpiled them. Now, they've been doing this for years. Why did they do this? They did it because they wanted to be able to provide for their country the most essential things that they would need to survive through a war, a famine, or even, you guessed it, a global pandemic. But interestingly enough, as we find ourselves here in a pandemic now, the country of Switzerland has changed their tune just a little bit. You see, they actually decided that one of the items that they have been stockpiling for a hundred years is no longer essential to human life. And I know I disagree with this, and maybe you'll disagree with this as well. Can you guess what is no longer essential to the Swiss life? Of course, it's not chocolate. They have millions of pounds of chocolate there, hidden somewhere in the Alps. It's not chocolate. It's not croissants where you might think, oh, maybe they're going to live without croissants. It's even worse than that. They have decided as a nation that it is no longer essential to have coffee in their life. Can you believe this? But they have been stockpiling coffee for over 100 years, which means they have 15,300 tons of coffee, and they are committed to getting rid of all of it by the year 2022. So today I'm letting you know that I'm now moving to Switzerland to help them in this effort of getting rid of all that coffee. Well, obviously I kid about that part. But have you ever seen something that you always thought was essential to life and then found out that maybe it wasn't? Or maybe vice versa, maybe there was something that you didn't think was very essential. And it turns out that is one of the most important things in your life. We're gonna talk about one of those things this morning. Because the truth is, as we are looking at our church community, we used to think that it is essential for us to just be in the building. And while it is great for us to gather together and to sing and to worship and learn in one place, what we're actually finding maybe is more essential is those really close connections 
to the community that we have. It's about being together with those friends that know you and you know them. You see, this is getting proved out time and time again. You see, research has shown, and there was a study that was recently done out in California, and it was done over a nine-year period, and what it found was that people with weak relational connections were three times more likely to die than those with strong relational connections. Now get this. This is where it gets crazy. People who had bad health habits, like smoking, eating the wrong types of foods, but had strong relational ties, lived significantly longer than people who had great health habits, but weak relational ties. So what can we learn from this? It is better for us to eat Lou Malnati's with others than it is to eat broccoli alone. Can I get an amen? Research time and time again is proving how important community is and how essential it is to each one of us. But the truth is that this is not a new problem. This is not a new dilemma. You see, actually in 1985, the average American had three close friends. You know what that average is now? It's two. We're actually becoming less connected over time, but it's also trending down. And so what, 10 years from now? Will the average American only have one close friend? And maybe 10 years after that, we're all just living alone in isolation. Something has got to change for our own health, for our own good, because it is how we are created. It's who we are. We are to be in community with one another. It is said that 25% of all Americans, that's one in four, have nobody to confide in. Think about that. One in four people have no one to confide in, no one that they trust, no one that they can go to when times are hard, no one there to help sharpen them and make them better. So here's the question. What's the cure? What's the cure for this loneliness pandemic that we are having in our world? What is the cure for this? You see, like I said, this is not a new problem. Because nearly 3,000 years ago, King Solomon, he wrestled with this problem. And it is said that he is one of the, if not the wisest man to have ever lived. He had great power. He had a huge fortune around him. Certainly, there were tons of people. There were advisors and those that would come and go in and out of the palace. It wasn't that he was having a shortness of conversations on any given day. And yet, he found something to be true. Despite all that he had, and despite all that is around him, he felt alone. Can you relate to King Solomon this morning? You might be looking around and your schedule is quite busy, but do you feel alone? Just a few years ago, I was driving home from church on a Sunday morning. And as I'm headed home, I'm thinking about my day, the time with family. I'm getting together with my friends that night to watch the football game that evening. And you know what's weird? I felt alone. I felt unseen. And in those moments as I'm driving home and this loneliness is starting to wash over me, I realize I have got to change something about how I connect with other people. Because just being busy and in a circle with other people or near other people is not a cure for loneliness. The only thing that can cure loneliness is connection. And Solomon knows this. And so he sits down in Ecclesiastes chapter 4 to write out a chapter about this loneliness because he has words for us. He has words for me in the midst of this chapter, and he has words for you this morning. He writes to the married couple who it looks like on the surface everything is great, and yet in their marriage there's a disconnect. 
He writes to the person who has destructive behavior, whether it's too much to drink, too many pills, looking at the images on a website that they should not be looking at and they know that does not glorify God. He's writing to that person who is trying to fill the voids in their life. Honestly, Solomon, as he writes in Ecclesiastes 4, he's writing to all of us just as much as he's writing to himself. So here's what it says. And we're going to start in verse 8. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asks. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless. A miserable business. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can anyone keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Here's what Solomon is saying in these verses. He's saying, look, your loneliness, I have been there. And it's gotten me nowhere. I've had it all. I've had the fame, I've had the riches, I've had the world swirling around my every command. And yet, if I'm not connected to someone else, I have nothing. See, it's not just Solomon. This sort of pattern happens time and time again throughout Scripture. In just the New Testament alone, 57 times the word one another comes up. An encouragement for us to be together, to be connected, to remove ourselves from isolation. Dave referenced last week in his message about the greatest visionary. And as he was talking about this dream and this hope and this vision that we have for Willow Creek as we move into the future, he said that everyone needs to be in a group and every group has to be a group on mission. And that's how we can cure some of this isolation. That's how we can cure some of this loneliness and not being known by others. In 2006, I moved from St. Louis right here into the Chicagoland area. I came to work at Willow Creek, but I did not know anyone at Willow Creek, even the person that hired me. Two weeks before I moved here, he moved away. I didn't know a soul. And I remember that being such a difficult time for me, trying to find friendships, trying to build all these relationships, and I felt often all alone. After a while, I was able to kind of befriend one guy. He was a single guy as well, but here was the problem. When you just have one friend, when that friend is busy, you're suddenly not busy. And I remember one time in particular, the office was closed. There really wasn't anything happening at church. I think it was around a holiday and my friend was away doing things with family. And I went a little over a week without really talking to anyone else, without having real connection. And I just kind of remember that feeling of like darkness and loneliness. I remember that. I also remember one night I'm sitting on my couch in my apartment and the only light in the whole place is the glow of the television because I'm cheap and I don't like lights just on in the house. But as I'm feeling that loneliness and that despair, just kind of sitting in that dark place, where my front door once was, there was suddenly this huge beam of light that came in and that friend walked through the door and he starts flipping on lights and opening curtains. And he's like, man, you can't sit like this much longer. You're going to hurt yourself. If you ask that friend to recount the story, he actually says when he walked in, I looked like Smeagol from Lord of the Rings, if you know what that looks like. You see, community, 
being together with other people, it is not just good for us. It's who we are. It's how God created us to be. It is my prayer that everyone at Willow South Lake will have that community. That we will come together into some groups and get to know one another. And then you will just find out how rich this church really is. When we sit and we are known and we are knowing others, that's when this thing called church starts to get really exciting. So I want to tell you about four things, and I'm going to do this real quick. I'm going to tell you about four things, four ways that when you go into a group that you can make the most of it so that you can be seen and be in community with other people. The first one is this. And we're going to take a principle out of Solomon's other book of Proverbs. But be this, be dependable. When you're going into community, you can't be kind of in and out. And we think that maybe if it's good, I'll stick around a little bit longer. But the truth is, if you stick around, that's when it gets good. Not the opposite. It says this in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born in adversity. When you go through it, and you know what it is, when you go through it with a group of people, you are bound together. My small group, when we first met, there were only two little kids that were a part of our small group. Within a year, We now have five little kids. I mean, there was a season in my personal small group where every female in my group was pregnant. We were going through it. And it bound us together. It bound us together. We have to be a people who is dependable. Often we'll think that maybe if it's good, then the connection will come. But if you stay consistent, if you are dependable, you will find that this consistency will drive the connection. And here's the truth. I want to tell you this right now. I'm the type of person that loves canceling plans. I can have a busy life. And when I look at my schedule for the day and I see I have a busy evening, there is nothing better than having those plans get canceled. And then it's just like, ah, the couch. But I want to challenge you. For your small group, be dependable every single time. Make it a priority. And in that priority, you will find the connection to other people. The second principle is this. Be dedicated to development. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, friends shape friends. I've heard a pastor once say that you are the sum of the people around you. Friends shape friends. Andy Stanley, another pastor, once said this, our friends determine the direction and quality of our lives. If you want a better life, get with friends who will sharpen you. Get out there and meet people who want more for you and want better for you and allow them to speak into your life. There's nothing better than a friend who sharpens another friend. While it may not feel great in the moment, man, in that time, you will find connection as iron sharpens iron. So first, be dedicated, be committed to your group, and then be dedicated to the development. Next, be discreet. Now, here's what I mean by this, because in Proverbs 11, verse 13, it says, A gossip betrays a confidence, but a trustworthy man keeps a secret. If people are going to come into your group and we're going to be real with one another, what's going to have to happen? I'm going to have to trust you and you're going to have to trust me. Get it? I'm going to have to trust you and you're going to have to trust me. So when I say something to you, When I say I'm struggling with this or I need help with this or I'm dealing with this area of my life, I need to know that not only one, are you praying for me and willing to challenge me, but also you're willing to keep that information to yourself. To be discreet. Now, we've kind of become a society of 
this, right? Masks. And oftentimes in churches, we've talked about taking off our mask and being real and authentic. And that's what I want to encourage you in this morning. And I'm not talking about the physical mask. I'm not talking about any sort of idea of how this virus may or may not get spread. I'm not telling you to take your mask off, literally. But for many of you, you've never sat in a group of people and shown them who you really are. And it's time. And maybe you struggle with it. You struggle with them and the idea that they will be trustworthy and discreet because maybe you have not been trustworthy and discreet. And it's time. It's time for us to come together and honor one another with our words and with our commitment to one another and to not fall into the trap of gossip and talking. Be discreet. Number four is this, be direct. And we have an opportunity when we get into group to not just talk about what? Football or the other things that might be happening in our life or the latest pop culture or politics and things like that. No, that we are to come together and be direct with what's happening in our lives and what God has for one another. If you see something in someone's life that needs loving rebuke, that you would be a person who would do that. But you would also be a person that can receive that. Proverbs 27, five through six. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Wounds of a friend can be trusted. Be direct. Be direct direct. Be dependable. Be dedicated to development. Be discreet and be direct. Here's the thing. Let me tell you the truth. You can survive without community. It's true. You can survive for quite a while without community. You can even come and be part of this church and not really be in the church, not really be the church, but it's like a life without tacos. Why would you ever want that? It's important and it's time for us, Willow Southlake, to taste what community is really like. And when we do that, like we're told in Ecclesiastes, a cord of three strands is not easily broken. It's reflected all over scripture where we get to sense that togetherness is so important, but really the master of this is Jesus. Because why? He was a true friend to those around him. He was dependable, so much so that he was willing to die on a cross for you. He was discreet. You can tell Jesus anything and his love for you has never changed. He's direct. He tells you when it's time to change directions. And he's dedicated to your development. He builds people up. He does not tear them down. And when we join in in a group, we get to mirror that for other people. Last verse today, Romans 5, 11. Now we can rejoice in our wonderful relationship with God all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done in dying for our sins, making us friends of God. It is my prayer for every single one of us that we will find community with one another, that we will be known, that we will work to push away a life of isolation and separation, but find ourselves sitting with others who will be dependable, who will be direct, who will be discreet, and who is dedicated to the development of everyone in that circle. And that is my prayer for us. Amen? Amen.
Now, next week, we are starting something as an entire church that I'm really excited about. It's called Journey Through Daniel. And what this is, is a couple times a year, our entire church dives into a book of the Bible together. We have devotionals that we read every day, messages that come every week that dive also into that content. And we have groups that meet all around a specific book of the Bible. And we're gonna get to dive into the book of Daniel. Now, a few things you need to know about Journey Through Daniel. First, the reading, the devotional content reading starts a week from Monday. And there's a couple ways to access that devotional. First, you can do all of that. You can access all of that content digitally at willowjourney.org. And so all the devotional content is available right there. Uh, we've got books for adults there, for students, and for kids. And there's uh, two different books for kids, one for preschool through first graders and another for second through fifth graders. And so that's an easy way to access all of the content germ-free by going online and accessing it digitally. Another way to access content is to actually pick up a physical copy of the book. And you can do that today at our church from 12 to 1 p.m. We've got books available for adults and for kids. All of the student content is going to be accessed digitally. So please take this week, get your book, and get geared up and ready to begin our reading together a week from Monday. Now, last week, as Dave Dummett, our senior pastor, shared the vision for our church, one of the things he talked about is that we want every person to be a part of a group. And so if you're listening to my voice, whether you're new, whether this is your first time watching, or whether you've been a part of our church for a long time, I want to challenge all of us to get in a group during Journey Through Daniel. These are four-week groups. They're not long, long-term commitments. So this is a great way uh, to get to know some people and also grow in our faith as we unpack and learn what God has for us in Daniel. Now there's lots of group of options available, but I wanna share with you three of them. And you can find all of this at wslathome.org and clicking on the groups tab. Uh, first, you can gather in a group virtually. Now we have all kinds of days and times available, so I'm confident you'll find something that works for your schedule. So that's one option. You can also gather in a watch party. Now, watch parties are opportunities for our church family to gather in backyards or in driveways, watch the service together on a Sunday morning, and then stick around for group discussion. Or uh, we also have some limited in-person opportunities available. If you're comfortable gathering in a home with people, you can also find out more about that. But this week, I wanna challenge all of you to find out, commit to a group, because these are gonna launch in just about a week. So go online, wslathome.org, click on the groups tab and get in a group for Journey Through Daniel. I'm so excited for our church to go on this journey together. Southlake, it was really great worshiping with you today. And remember this Sunday, come on by from 12 to 1 to pick up your Journey Through Daniel books. And while you're here, it'd be great if you could help us pack some prison packs. At Willow, we have this tradition of really wanting to love and care for the marginalized. And especially during the Christmas season, those who are incarcerated in the state of Illinois really need to know that they are loved and seen. And we want to share Jesus' love with them. And one of the ways that we do that is by packing Christmas gift bags for our prison inmates. You can do that this Sunday at church, 12 to one, even if it's just one or two packs that you can pack, it'll really make a difference in the life of someone who would love to know the love of Jesus. Now in just a couple of minutes, our family service is gonna start. So if you're gonna join us for family service, I'll see you then.
promise. I'm about to go on a prayer walk and I would love for you to join me. Come on, let's go. Well, we're coming upon a stop sign. This stop sign reminds me to think of what God might want me to stop doing. Today, I'm reminded not to worry so much. And so I'm going to pray right now that God helps me to stop worrying. And this is our neighborhood mailbox. And when I see the mailbox, it reminds me to pray for those who are far from me, like my sister. I'm so glad you're on this walk with me. In my neighborhood, there's a Walgreens. Some people go here to get medicine when they are sick. It reminds me to pray for those who are sick and need to get better. Well, today, we're going to learn about someone who prayed to God while being in the belly of a fish. But first, here's Jason Payton to share our memory verse with us this week. God is patient with you. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. Instead, He wants all people to turn away from their sins. 2 Peter 3, 9 Great job, Jace and Peyton. Hi friends, it's Mr. Koke here. Let's repeat our memory verse again, but this time with motions. God is patient with you. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. Instead, he wants all people to turn away from their sins. Second Peter 3 9. Very good. Let's all stand up and stretch our arms high in the air. Shake them from side to side and let's tell Jesus how much we want to follow Him. Where you go, I'll go. Where you say, I'll stay. When you
And I'm Mr. Rocky. Back when we used to gather at Promised Land, I loved using the whiteboard when teaching large group. So for today's family service, we will tell you Jonah's story using my favorite tool, the whiteboard. So let's get right to it. Jonah and the Big Fish, told by Miss Lucille. Stick figures by Mr. Rocky. This is Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. You can think of a prophet as God's messenger. Hello. One day, God spoke to Jonah. God told Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh to tell him to stop doing bad things. But Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. Instead, he decided to go in the opposite direction of Nineveh to a place called Tarshish. So, he boarded a boat. And as soon as the boat left shore, God sent a great storm to get jo Jonah's attention. Jonah told the other men on the boat that if they threw him overboard into the sea, the storm would stop. So they did. Then, God sent a big fish to save Jonah. It actually swallowed Jonah whole. And Jonah was in its belly for three days. While in the fish's belly, Jonah prayed to God. Jonah asked God for help and for forgiveness for disobeying God's instructions. After three days, God told the big fish to spit Jonah out onto dry land. And God told Jonah for the second time, go to Nineveh. This time, Jonah obeyed God. Jonah headed straight to Nineveh to give him God's message. Through Jonah, we learn that God is patient and ready to forgive. Our sins are never too big to be forgiven by God. Do you know how God is able to forgive us? Because of Jesus. The story of Jonah actually reminds us of Jesus. In the same way that Jonah spent three days in the belly of the big fish, Jesus spent three days in the belly of the earth. He was dead and buried in a tomb. But did Jesus stay there? No way. Just like Jonah was spit from the giant fish, Jesus was raised from the dead and came out of the tomb. The story of Jonah is a reminder that Jesus paid the price for our sins and that God, with his great patience, is always ready to give us another chance. Isn't that awesome? All right, Mr. Josh is up next to explain how we can use Jonah's story in our lives this week. Take it away, Mr. Josh. Well, hey, Promise Land friends, it's Mr. Josh. So in this week's lesson, we learned that God has enormous patience for all of us. And that is a good thing because we often need a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, and so on. 
In fact, I'm willing to bet that not only do we need second chances, but there may be people in your life that need a second chance from you, right? Maybe someone who's made a mistake to you or upset you in some way and they need a second chance. Maybe it's one of your parents. Maybe it's a brother or a sister. Maybe it's a friend, a classmate, a teammate, whomever. Today's lesson should teach us that God has enormous patience for us. He gives us second chances, and we need to do the same by showing others a second chance as well. So guys, I want to challenge you. Take the Bible verse and make it into a prayer about this. For example, you can pray and just thank God for having so much patience for you, right? for all of us. You can pray and thank God that he wants everyone to come to him. He wants everyone to turn away from sin and follow him. And of course, you can thank God that he loves us so much and that he gives us a second chance, but also pray that he gives you patience, you forgiveness, you the strength to show a second chance to others. And I think one way you can do that this week as you practice that prayer is to do what Miss Julie challenged us all to do. Go on a prayer walk. Just walk around your neighborhood using different moments, different reminders, maybe it's a house, a sign, whatever, as a reminder to pray for others, to pray for your family, and also to thank God for being the God of second chances, and then pray for those around us. So here's a little view of me going on a short prayer walk that I did. As I come to this first corner on my walk, it's a great reminder to ask God to help me to turn corners away from things that I know are wrong. And then, as I just simply walk past my neighbors, let me pray for each of them. And then finally, when I get home, let me thank God for giving me a place to call home. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Josh. I hope that when you go on your walk this week, that you can do a prayer walk just like Mr. Josh and me. And I would love to see the things around your neighborhood that help you to pray. So take a picture and send it to me at this email below. Well, that's it for us today. Until next time, bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye, everyone. Have a great day. <laughs> I didn't want anyone to be destroyed. Anyone? <laughs> I don't want anyone to be destroyed. Yes, he does not. No, he does not. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. I instead. 